Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Pinstripe Prospects Podcast, episode number 28. Happy to be back with you once again this week as we are a couple weeks away from September, which means we're about halfway through the season. Amazing how fast the season goes. We had a great show for you over the next hour. We're going to talk about Aaron Judge going on the IL. We'll talk about DJ LeMayhew on the IL. So the Yankees have more players on the injured list, but their offense just keeps rolling. Or they're just playing the Red Sox a lot. We're going to get into that. We'll talk about the impact of the Judge injury, the impact of the LeMayhew injury. Miguel and Duhar's back in the big leagues and not playing a great left field, but we'll get into that. We'll give you our three up, three down from the Red Sox series. Because, well, there, there was... I don't know if we're going to find any downs, but we'll try. I just feel like there was a lot more ups and downs in that series because, well, the Red Sox are bad. We'll look ahead to the rest of the race series and the first installment of the Subway series this week, which is sadly no no Garrett Cole and no Jacob deGrom. I mean, I think every Yankee Mets series should have at least one of those guys, and, well, they don't. The Mets, the Mets even though they're beating up the Marlins, aren't exactly something to write home about. Of course, we'll give our thoughts on Fernando Tatis Jr. versus the Texas Rangers and, well, why the Texas Rangers are being too sensitive, at least in my opinion. And, of course, we'll give our final thoughts for the week. So we want to remind you, you can tweet us anytime at Pinstripe Pros, like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. We hope uh, we hope we get a five-star ring, but we just want to hear from you. Give us your feedback, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, you can feel free to email me as well, rickjkeeler at gmail.com. And wherever you get your podcast, chances are the Pinstripe Prospects podcast is there. So start downloading us today. We'll give you more information on our dugout subscription, um, dugout membership subscription a little bit later on. So once again, I'm pleased to be joined by my two co-hosts for this episode. Uh, James O'Connell is back. James, how you doing? Doing great, Ricky, uh, as always. Watching some baseball and talking on the show. So doing great. There you go. And also the person who runs our great social media, Alexis Farinacci, is here. Alexis, how you doing? Doing good. Uh, it was nice to get away with some friends for the weekend. You might have noticed our social media was a little quiet. Uh, I went out to a weightlifting meet in Orlando and spent the weekend with a bunch of friends there. So it was nice to get away and it was a nice little mini vacay this weekend. So feeling good. Glad to hear it. Uh, so let's get into some of the Yankee injury news, uh, the first part of the show. And I, I think... But, uh, we should start with Aaron Judge. And it's not because of Judge injury, because Aaron Boone gave an update today, and it, it sounds like Aaron Judge hopefully will be back on Saturday. So the aisle stint won't be that long with the calf strain. It's not really grade one. It's like, I guess, half a grade, which is weird. But you had, remember, we were we were on the show last week, and Aaron Boone says, we just needed, he just needs a little bit of rest. He was on the turf in Tampa. He's going to be fine. And then the next day, it's, well, he can't. He's got lower, t- lower tightness in the lower area. He's going to be fine. We'll see what happens on Friday, and then Friday he's on the injured list, and we never hear from Aaron Judge until Sunday, which is also a little bit weird. It, it just seems like Alexis. And I'll start with you on this. It just the Yankees, the way they communicate injuries over the last two or three years, <laughs> it's something we would make fun of the Mets for, and now they're kind of starting to do it. And it's something that should make every fan angry that it just doesn't seem like they're they're honest at all. Because I get it, maybe they're trying to protect Judge in a way, but I don't like that this just feels like they're lying to you. Yeah, it was definitely a little bit sketchy the way things went down with that injury. Um, you know, you hear, uh, like you mentioned, in the press conferences of Boone saying, oh, we just need to get off his feet. You know, he's just a little tight. The turf, you know, uh, the guys after they come off turf need a break. Uh, I don't know that we've ever heard that coming out of Tampa, to be honest with you. Um, so I think everybody was a little skeptical at that point. And then when he was out of the lineup the next day, you knew something was weird. And it just felt like they were trying to hide it. And it's like, if he's injured, just come out and say it. Um, you know, yeah, the Yankees have been injury plagued and everybody knows it. And that's what they're trying to avoid. And they don't want the backlash from it. But if a guy like Judge is, is injured, come out and say it. And let's just get it over with. Yeah, I've heard that with Toronto, I think, is the turf where you probably feel that. But, James, I think if he felt that in Tampa, he shouldn't have played both games that doubleheader, even, even if he's just DHing. I mean, I know the race games are important, but if Aaron Judge needs a day then, give him a day then. Like, I, I, I just don't get it. 
Uh, agreed. But the only thing I really don't like about this entire situation is just the Aaron Boone lying thing. Just, oh, no, we took him out of the game because, because uh, you know, we just want to give him some rest. We, we knew, I think everyone knew that just wasn't, that wasn't, no matter how much we wanted it to be true, we knew it really wasn't. Um, that's the only thing I really don't like out of this. If, if he if he wants to give Aaron Judge a, a break precaution for precautionary reasons, then fine, come out and say that. Um, I think everyone kind of had an overreaction. I, I know some of the Yankee fans I talked to had an overreaction, like, oh, if he's healthy, he should be playing every day. This and that. At the end of the day, the regular season isn't the bigger picture here. You you want everyone healthy for the postseason. That's uh, so. If you want to give Aaron Judge a week or two off, give him a week or two off. That, you, that's the luxury the Yankees have for being this deep of a ball club. And that's the luxury, honestly, uh, that every baseball team almost has because in a 60-game season, 16 teams are making the playoffs. Where if this postseason bubble does happen, and Jeff Passan had more information on Tuesday that it's looking like maybe San Diego and Texas would be the places the bubble would take place. You're not getting home field. You're not getting the advantages that a top seed would get outside of winning your division. You want to give a guy a day or two off over 60 days, that's fine. Because then, honestly, the only thing you get is winning the division. The Yankees are going to be in the playoffs. Basically, they're just playing out the string, practically, outside of trying to win a division. So if if you want to give Judge a day off, like I I get people like, oh, you're treating 60 like 162. Well, you kind of have to because you want to avoid these injuries that are just cropping up, especially for pitchers. Look at all the elite pitchers going down with crazy injuries this year. Yeah, I don't know why people have a problem with this. Like, I, I the only thing people should have a problem with is the fact that Aaron Boone uh, kind of lied to the media, to to the fans. That, that's the only issue that should be at hand here. But other than that, taking precautionary reasons, uh, precautionary measures for Aaron Judge to stay healthy throughout the, the 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 prime time of the season to when you really need him to be healthy, is the right move. Is just the right move to make. So uh, anyone that's upset by putting Aaron Judge on the IL when he says, oh, no, I feel 100%. Uh, don't be upset by that. Look at the bigger picture. What if he actually wasn't 100%? Baseball players lie all the time. Athletes lie all the time about their health because they want to go out and play. So if you're mad about this, Aaron Boone did a very good job taking precautionary measures to make sure this guy's healthy for the stretch run. I don't think another question I had on the rundown is it, does it add to the idea of these injury prone? I don't think it adds to the injury prone idea. It just adds to the fact that judge really wants to play every day. As to you, you said, James, like they, the, the Yankees, I think are just trying to protect him from himself because they realize they need him in October. They yeah. honestly, they need his leadership, but it's not as bad as a couple of years ago when judge went out for an extended period of time. And you can argue that was where the Yankees lost the division. They're going to be fine if it's for even a week or two. They that's not a huge worry to them. No, it's it's really not. And and you could see they, they and once sep- I believe September hits or really the end of August, the schedule becomes kind of a joke. So if winning games is in the regular season is your number one priority, your number one issue here, I, I wouldn't be all too concerned about it. You have a a very light schedule coming up. And Alexis, when you look at the Yankees outfield depth, I mean, we've seen Clint Frazier have a really great week since coming up. We've seen, of course, Mike Talkman continues to be Mike Talkman. If anything, it just gives those guys that are that have been coming off the bench and playing maybe a couple of times a week more playing time and a chance to help this lineup even more. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've seen it. Uh, Clint Frazier has just looked phenomenal since he's been brought back up. Uh, had a great weekend against the Red Sox again, just putting up uh, at bats, putting up RBIs. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to hit for him to get some playing time. Um, I think I'm in agreement with everybody. A little bit wrong about how Aaron Boone went went about it, but if he's just trying to give Judge a break, all right, so be it. I do agree with that decision. Um, you know, Talkman just had a phenomenal play out in left field tonight, uh, just during this last inning um, that saved extra bases. These guys are getting extra play time. Their bats are starting to come around. Um, you know, I think it's okay to be able to give some of these guys breaks. We've got the depth in our roster to be able to do it. The other big news in the injury list, of course, from Saturday's game, uh, DJ LeMahieu leaving in the fourth inning. Uh, with a sprain left thumb. He's got the second opinion. It sounds like he's only going to miss two to three weeks, which is really great news, all things considering. And even, I think, Alexis, when you look at these two weeks, the Yankees have so many days off. Over the next couple of weeks with that two-game series in Atlanta, if it's just two weeks, the Yankees, in all honesty, only miss LeMahieu for a handful of games. 
they got the best possible news that it's basically, if you look at a repeat of the injury he had with the Rockies a couple of years ago, and he's going to be back. So my question to both of you, and Alexis, I'll start with you, is LeMahieu the most irrepla- irreplaceable player on the roster? I don't know that you use the term irreplaceable. Um, I think it's a void that's definitely going to be missed in the roster. Uh, but at the same token, again, there's guys that are starting to produce. Um, they're starting to play well. So if we can get guys like Gary Sanchez to start swinging his bat and to get it to wake up a little bit, which it seems like it's starting to happen. Um, Talkman's been swinging a good bat. Uh, if you can get Wade to start swinging, that'd be great too with, with him at second base. Uh, Voight's been looking hot. So these guys, some of these guys who are starting to, uh, the season off quiet are starting to pick back up a little bit, and I think that's what you need. But I think LeMahieu's definitely going to be missed in the roster. But I wouldn't say irreplaceable, but definitely probably one of the bigger hits we're going to take. So in your mind, who who would be that guy? Man, I mean, I like Wade at second base, but in the same token, you've you got to have guys swing in the back. Um, well, no, I, I meant who in your oh, if it's not the yeah. who would be the most irreplaceable player in your mind? On is it? I mean, I guess my thought would be if not Lemayhu, then Cole. I I'd say Cole or Judge. Um, I think Judge has been really really hot too. Um, he's got that power to be able to to get it out of the park. Um. That that's a toss up between between Judge and Lemayhu on on who's the most irreplaceable there, but definitely Cole. Uh, Cole could be top of that list too. Um, you lose an ace, and that's going to be a big deal. James, what about you? Yeah, if you strike Garrett Cole from this roster, um, you you're you're looking at a pretty, pretty ugly pitching staff. That's just he's got to be the most irreplaceable guy on this team. Um, but as far as Lemayhu, uh, you just got to hope this thing doesn't linger because. Thumb injuries can linger, and we saw he he had a thumb injury, I believe, in 2018, and he batted like 277. He he just wasn't healthy. Um, you gotta hope he comes back healthy, because at the end of the day, I think he is the most irreplaceable bat in this lineup, because I don't really know how many four hit 400 hitters are around, and especially on this team that is so just prone to the strikeout, so so just power oriented. You need someone like DJ LeMahieu in there. Uh, you, you do. Because w- without that bat, then you're right back to that 2018 lineup. And everyone remembers how frustrating that 2018 season was. Um, LeMahieu adds a different element to this team. I think everyone knows that. And without him, they're a far, far worse team. They, they just are. You, you need him at the top of that lineup. I think that when you look at the absence of LeMahieu just over the last three games. Now, I don't think it's affected the Yankees that much offensively, at least yet. But you've seen Aaron Boone thrown out weird lineups. You've seen Mike Talkman hit third. You've seen Luke Voigt hit cleanup. You, I mean, hit leadoff. You've seen Gio Urshela hit leadoff. I mean, Aaron Boone, I don't know if this is the Sabre metric department, but they are throwing out some really crazy lineup combinations that you would go, wait, Mike Talkman's hitting third? But for some reason, it works. And I, and I go back to, I was watching the game Saturday. And normally, I don't like the points John Smoltz makes. But John Smoltz, I thought, brought up a really good point. The Yankees have a different type of offense with those guys out, but the output stays the same. They just score runs differently. And to be honest, when you look at what works in October, this style with the new look offense without these guys would work more than just relying on the home run. It's really weird because you want the home runs to happen, and they're great, but you want the home run guys to play with the style that the a minus squad seems to play with. It's kind of a weird dynamic that just works for the Yankees in a way. I, I agree to an extent. Um, I, I don't think this team is as all or nothing as people kind of make them out to be when, when they're out there. I don't think Aaron Judge is an all or nothing guy. John Carlos Stanton, yeah, probably an all or nothing guy. But when they're healthy, I don't know. Like I feel like everyone kind of overreacts in that sense that they're just all that, – that, they're home run or nothing, home run or nothing. Sure, they hit a lot of home runs, but they, they put together at bats, man. They get on base, you know, but needless to say here, um, I lost my thought. Someone come back to me. I lost my thought. It's, no, it's, oh, wait, no, no. Okay, I found it. I found it. It's back. So I just think this A minus lineup that we're throwing out here is just, it's a testament to what a winning culture is all about. Um, if you looked at the other side uh, uh, against against the Red Sox there, you could argue that lineup was far more talented than the lineup the Yankees are putting out. And and likely you would be right in that setting. But the problem here is it's just a winning culture can go so far because it, the Red Sox are completely disinterested. 
that they're a talented group, 100%. Some of the worst pitching in baseball agreed. But that lineup, they, they are as talented as they come as far as a bottom of the barrel team. But even if they're – I argue they're like a middle-of-the-pack lineup talent-wise, even towards the top. Regardless, they have so much talent over there. And the Yankees were throwing out quadruple-A players for, for the most part. Not even – I mean, you know, not throwing digs at anyone. But they're, these aren't these aren't their starters. Like Mike Ford's not not really – He's not their star starting bat. He's not their three hitter. Urshel is not their two hitter. Voigt's not their leadoff hitter. Like this is just, it's not, it's not really what this team obviously was supposed to be. But it really is just a testament to what a winning, how far a winning culture can go. And obviously, in in other places, there's not a winning. There's talents everywhere. But if you don't have that winning culture, you're not going to go anywhere, man. And Alexis, I think that that point is brought up best. You look at Monday's lineup. You look at that lineup on paper on Monday, and you're like, "Whoa, what are we doing here?" Like Eric Kratz is playing, and G or, and like the Yankees lineup, they're giving guys days off, and it's looking like, "All right, we've won the first three games in the series. If the Red Sox get this one, because a lot of guys are getting the night off, that's fine." And they still go out and put up the same amount of runs that you could argue the starters were going to put up. And that's the crazy part about this lineup when guys play. They find a way to 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 come out and perform because I think Mark Gross, I heard him say Sunday on a sports final with Bruce Beck on NBC that a lot of these guys he DeRosa thought would be starters on 20 of the 30 major league teams at least. Yeah, I think you again you look at the depth of this roster and these are all guys that can absolutely produce from top to bottom if they're all awake and they're all feeling good and they're all swinging the bats. This is a dangerous lineup regardless of who's in there. And I think, again, we saw it last night with the runs put up. Uh, this is a lineup that can produce. Um, there's that, That's just what it is. So looking at with the LeMahieu injury from a second base from specific, specifically, you look at Tyler Wade, he's going to get every opportunity uh, to perform at that position. But we've also seen the Yankees play Tyro Estrada, who homered on Monday, got the start in Tuesday's opener against the Rays. And now we talk about proving ground. It's Tyler Wade, of course, now get more of a chance to show that speed element, that different kind of small ball idea that not a lot of the Yankees seem to have so he can perform in his own way. But I think also, Alexis, we talk about Estrada as a guy that seems to always be on the roster and never gets to play. And now he gets to play and he's hitting homers and going one so far one for two in Tuesday's game. He's trying to prove a point as well. And he can play anywhere around the diamond if they want to give – uh, Shrot, uh, or Shell and night off. You can see your shot to play third even. So he could play multiple positions. Yeah. I definitely like, uh, Estrada's versatility, um, as well as his bat. Uh, I've always been a fan of Estrada from him kind of coming up through the minor leagues to where he's at today. Um, absolutely great, great ball player. Um, when you give him the opportunity and his versatility to be able to play wherever he's needed, uh, is phenomenal, especially right now. James, what do you think on the Wade Estrada? What are you looking for from the second base position, at least for the next couple of weeks? I honestly think Tyler Wade has a lot to prove. Um, I, I know he, everyone loves his speed, but Tyler Wade's, uh, sorry, Tyler Estrada's not slow. Um, you know, Estrada is a real talented bat too. And honestly, kudos to him for coming back from getting sh- literally shot. Like it's unbelievable what this guy has done. So just kudos to him in general, but Overall, very talented kid. Uh, I was a little surprised that we didn't see him more often last year at points. We, I know we saw him for a brief moment, but um, he was really, really good when, when he had playing time. And he continues to produce whenever he gets out there. So I do like Tyro Estrada. He's a nice little bat to have. He's, he can play really – didn't he play some outfield last year if I'm not – if I don't – I yeah, I remember him playing a little bit of outfield. I think it was in like San Francisco or something. But the, yeah. I remember the Yankees at least experimenting with that. Yeah, this is this is another one of those guys that you can just plug in and you really don't have to worry about much. The guy can hit, the guy can feel, the guy can run. Um, that's just the luxury of being the New York Yankees, I guess. You just so deep, it's crazy where, where these guys come from. He's kind of that forgotten player in a way because he always seems to be on the roster. And even when the Yankees make roster moves, he's still there. He just yeah. never gets in the game. Like, I can't that, understand. I'm happy he gets yeah. to play at least a little bit. Yeah, I can't understand for the life of me how he's not on other teams' radars. How how was a team not trying to trade for Tyro Estrada? Like just any team really, like anyone who who needs kind of middle infield help. Well, this is a talented guy who can really plug in and play whenever you need him to. 
Uh, it's just, just weird to me because he's obviously blocked off here uh, when, when it's all said and done, when everyone's healthy. He's blocked off really at short and second um, and third. So I don't know why teams aren't calling on him. Maybe they are. Obviously, I'm not, I'm not in Brian Cashman's ear. But uh, just, you know, just interesting that, that he's, he's, still, he's just still a Yankee to me. I don't know. I feel like the team should be calling on him. Very quickly before we get into the Red Sox, here, let's talk about this series opener for the Yankees, uh, losing six to three to the Rays. Now just a game and a half out of Tampa, they've lost four of the last five to the Rays this season. So definitely not a good thing for looking for the AL East division perspective. Not a good night for Tanaka on the mound. Goes just four innings, five in runs after allowing only one run. or throwing really great baseball in Tropicana Field the last time. Uh, these two teams face off in this exact same matchup. Blake Snell is now 2-0 against the Yankees. with the five, Not a great performance from Snell, but good enough. Honestly, I think this was a game after Monday night with a rain delay, and the Yan- really no no big-time relievers were available for the Yankees in this game. It was, tonight was all about survival. And, I mean, Gary Sanchez hits a homer. Lou Voigt does one of the lead-up spots we talked about. But the Yankees did okay. I mean, they did lose the game, but... They got Nick Nelson and Luis Sessa did a good job keeping it close. The rare time you want to hit by a pitch not to count in the seventh inning, I think kind of led to the Yankees not at least getting one run in that situation. And you can't blame Boyd for the strikeout, I think, because Castillo was just throwing nasty sliders. I mean, we'll get into that whole 3 3 1, 3 2, 3 0 oh, count thing later. But I think an expected result, you can't win every game, and that's just one. It's frustrating to lose, but at least the Yankees didn't have to like blow through everybody in their bullpen and live to fight another day in a way. Yeah. And I think uh, you brought up the fact of Nelson, uh, Nick Nelson looked absolutely be phenomenal being, uh, called back up today from, uh, Scranton and the, um, taxi squad or, uh, extra camp, whatever we're calling it now. Um, but Nelson going three innings pitched, uh, one hit, no runs, one walk, two strikeouts. Uh, really, really good night for him. And then Sessa, two innings pitch, no hits, no runs, three strikeouts. Uh, a really good night for those two guys uh, on a night that they needed. They needed to perform, and they kept the Yankees in it tonight. Yeah, I think big picture, James, when we look at, we've seen kind of Paxson turn in the corner the last two starts, and now we've kind of seen Tanaka again. He's Mr. Consistency. That's a start, though. The Yankees need you to go deep into the ball game and – you can only go four innings. It's kind of with Tanaka in the regular season. We know what he does in the playoffs, but it always seems like he goes one to two steps forward and then takes those steps back in a way. Yeah. I mean, just a typical kind of Tanaka start where he didn't really look all that. In- it's not that he didn't look interested. He just, he wasn't locating. Well, I mean, this is going to happen. Um, and, and, and every start, but a postseason start for him, I guess. Um, yeah, this is just a typical regular season blow up from Tanaka. It happens. Literally every year it's happened for, since he's got here. I think Tanaka is honestly – the Yan- Yankee fans just kind of accept who he is, which is surprising to me. I, I don't really see too much people too, or too many people um, on Twitter saying things about, oh, Tanaka's this, Tanaka's that. I think everyone kind of accepts who he is, that he is going to get lit up once in a while in the regular season. But in the postseason, you're going to get – you know you know what you're going to get. So um, overall, tonight's game – First loss at home. Uh, they had their opportunities for sure. Uh, Base loaded one out in, in the seventh, I believe. They, they had their opportunities, but um, just just couldn't come through. And, and honestly, that's going to happen. I don't love the fact that they've lost four out of five to Tampa. That That is concerning in itself because there is a very good chance that, they're, that pass, their paths cross in the postseason. Um, yeah. Overall, just it happens, man. You're going to lose a game at home once in a while. So nothing really to panic about. And that's the thing I was talking about when we were doing the shows in the off season, and we, I was saying the Rays could be a threat to the Yankees in this division, and I would give them a good chance to do it, even though I still think the Yankees win this division. They just have a weird group, and weird can beat the Yankees in a way. Because you look, you look at the names they threw out there tonight: Fairbanks, Diego Castillo, Nick Anderson, Chaz Rose saving the game. There, there's just different guys, and their resumes might not be great out of that bullpen, but they all do something different. They all have different types of pitches that work for them, and you can't exactly stay on the same pitch over time. Now, maybe the bullpen wears out for the Rays down the stretch or something like that, and it changes things, but it just seems like whenever the Yankees face that Rays bullpen, 
nothing happens because a lot of the, what they do is against the, the starters, ironically, is when they get to Glasgow and they get to Morton. But when they get to that raised bullpen, there's not much that they do. And that has to be, I think, somewhat of a concern because what you know what you're getting with the Yankee bullpen. The raised bullpen, they just throw – they can turn anybody into a great reliever practically. I think you hit the nail on the head before before the show we were talking. Um, they're just weird. Tampa's just a weird, weird team. Um, and the Yankees don't play good against weird. You said that word for word, I'm pretty sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it, there's just something – it's just something about Tampa just – when you see six to seven, I, I don't that didn't happen tonight, but in general, when you see six or seven different pitchers in a game, um, it's it's tough. It, it's tough to kind of adjust to to, to so Tampa really uh, they play a different style and and it works for them. It, it does. I, I don't know how many other teams this would work for. It just it's just so fitting that they they play this way that Kevin Cash manages this team this way and, and it just it, it works for them. They 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 win in the regular season as often as anyone. So um, Tampa, man, they're, they're just a weird, weird team. And this is just a different group. Cause we looked at Alexis, we looked at the Rays before that last series and, and they've had came, coming off being swept by the Orioles, but you kind of seen the impact Austin Meadows has had in that lineup when Meadows is at the top of the order and Brandon Lau's hitting like he did tonight with the home run off Tanaka. Susugo's playing third. And he's making good plays at third base, even though he's not really known for playing third base. They're just different. When they have everybody in that lineup and everybody does something different, it's a hard combination to crack, it just seems like. Yeah, and I think we're seeing it. The, the Rays just have the Yankees number uh, right about now for this season, um, at least right now. Um, but, yeah, that's that's a dangerous lineup. Uh, Snell on the mound. You talked about it with Meadows in there at the top of the lineup and a few of those other guys. The Rays are a good team. That's why they've contended the past few seasons. Uh, they're a team to be reckoned with. I think they're a team that people kind of sleep on a little bit, and people need to not. Uh, again, they're not far back behind the Yankees now in the AL East. Um, so these series against the Rays are going to be absolutely crucial for the Yankees. Because it's not really the division that you worry about, albeit it's great to win a division. But that's you look at being either the 1-8 or you look at being the 4-5. That's basically the difference of playing a team like Baltimore or Texas or Cleveland or playing in a 4-5 against the best second-place team, which I I guess right now the other second-best sec, best second-place team would be the White Sox. And the White Sox are no joke either. They hit back-to-back-to-back-to-back to back to back to back home runs the other day. And that lineup, that team is so much fun, that offense. So that you're looking at more the matchup than the – division with this kind of format and you'd rather play a team like texas or dare i say the orioles in that kind of <laughs> format it, it's weird and we'll get to that later these cool bad teams that are all of a sudden not horrendous but that's the difference this year i'd rather play the orioles or rangers two out of three than play the white Sox or indians two out of three and that's the difference between the one seed and the four four or five seed it's this three game series is absolutely ridiculous. I, I cannot stress enough how annoying it is that this has to happen. Um, but it is what it is. And, and that's why the Yankees, I believe they get like a choice of who they want to play. Right. That's, they have the social no, selection. No, that, that was the old, oh, that's the old format. Yeah. That was the format they thought about, didn't decide. And I think now it's just seating. If it's one, eight, two, seven, three, six okay. kind of thing. Yeah. I don't, I just don't like that. I, I really don't like that. Uh, I don't think really anyone does, especially as Yankee fans. It makes no sense, but uh, it's a conversation for another day. So before we get in our three up, uh, three down from the Red Sox series, I remind you that we provide exclusive Miley content to our paid subscribers, our new dugout membership program. You get scouting reports, player interviews, features, and much more in addition to our free major league coverage. Sign up today for our dugout membership program for either $5 and 50 cents a month or $40 a year. And if you're not sure about us, we give you 30 days free if you use the promo code hashtag Welcome Back Baseball. Again, that's hashtag Welcome Back Baseball. Got to use the hashtag in there. So if you're not sure, give us a shot. I think you'll enjoy it. We have always great interviews up. Uh, I know Alexis did an interview with Beck Wayne. Alexis, you have another interview up with uh, Montana Semmel. Uh, why don't you tell us about that a little bit? Yeah, so I had the opportunity uh, to talk to Semmel last week. Uh, about a fundraiser he did uh, in his local hometown uh, for COVID-19 uh, to help the frontline workers at his local hospital there. 
Uh, a great interview. Uh, absolutely really good guy. 18 years old, uh, but absolutely so mature for his age and a pleasure to talk with. Uh, 2019 uh, draft pick for the Yankees. Uh, it's up on our website. It'll be up on our social media tomorrow. Definitely go check that out. So that's the kind of stuff you get when you get our dugout ministry program. You get these cool interviews as well. Uh, so be, if you use the hashtag Welcome Back Baseball, using the hashtag as your promo code, you get to read those. So definitely check both those interviews out. There's some uh, great content on there. So let's take a look at that Red Sox series. As I mentioned at the top of the show, a lot more ups than downs. I feel like all of us can be reaching for three downs because I, I was saying it before we got on the air. I mean, I know as looking at the Yankees, you're never supposed to feel bad for the Red Sox. I'm watching some of these games, and they're not really competitive. And I know Boston's on the verge of losing potentially nine in a row. Something just feels off. Because normally these games are supposed to be like four hours long and very close. And they're just not. Just the Yankees are up here, and the Red Sox are way down here. It never even felt like that when the Red Sox are winning titles. The Yankees would at least hang around and be close in games. It's just so lopsided right now. Yeah, it's it's very simple. Uh, as much as I mentioned that winning culture before, the Red Sox don't have that. And you take away Alex Cora, you take away Mookie Betts, you take away some of these guys from that locker room, and it's just not the same. So, so the guys that are left over, the 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 Devers, the Bogarts, the uh, the Bentendi, whoever, uh, they just those guys are supposed to be the leaders in the clubhouse, and it just it probably isn't feeling the same for them. It just nothing is the same anymore. Alex Cora is not your manager. Um, Mookie Betts isn't your leader. Chris Sale isn't in there anymore. David Price isn't in there anymore. So it it all goes back to that winning culture um, and just that winning environment. Uh, Ron, I don't want to jump down Ron Ranicki's throat yet, but it's just I guarantee you this there may this would be very different should Alex have if Alex Cora was running that clubhouse. Um, so I'm sure everything's just very different for some of those leftover guys from that 2018 team. And uh, they're just not really adjusting well to it. And I told everyone from the beginning of the season that this was a very bad baseball team. I said it. They are so freaking bad. I didn't know they were going to be the worst team in baseball bad, but I knew they were going to be very, very bad. Um, yeah, not to toot my own horn there, but yeah, they're they're a bad team, really bad team. It, it, to me, it just feels like Lexus. It's one we we talked about. I know a lot of a lot of people talked about before the season started that there could be teams that just punt the season. It just feels like the Red Sox punted this year. It, 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 I hate to say that about a team, and J.D. Martinez has been – honestly, he's not – he's been awful. And, and and now being talked about in trades, who knows if he gets traded. It, it just feels like the Red Sox just said, we'll move on to 2021 because it's hard to believe. Look at, look at the pitchers they threw out there this weekend. It's basically a bunch of openers and Martin Perez. Like, that's not competitive. Yeah, it's definitely been an odd season for the Red Sox. Uh, and the fact that they have come out and said that, hey, anybody's kind of fair game for being traded right now. That's a that's a tall order there saying, hey, regardless of who you are on our roster, you're vulnerable right now. Um, definitely an odd season for the Sox. So as we lead to that, let's talk about three up, three down. Let's let's stay positive. Let's let's go, let's go to three up. We're gonna it's gonna not be hard to find positives. Uh, Alexis, what's your three up for this week? Oh uh, man, my three ups for this week. Um, I gotta go. Aaron Hicks. Uh, I thought he had a great series against the Red Sox uh, with multiple RBIs. Um, Luke Voigt for sure. Um, and then gotta go Cole. Uh, again, thought he just looked phenomenal on Friday night against the Sox. Definitely good choices. Uh, James, what are your three up? Uh, I'm going to start with Luke Voigt. I, I think people forget. I, I said this before. I think people forget just how good he is when he's healthy, just how good of a hitter he is. Um, this is a luxury to have. He's, he's probably the six hitter, seven hitter when, when you have a fel- fully healthy lineup. So Luke Voigt won. Obviously, Clint Frazier. Um, the guy's just been putting on a complete show. Uh, he's taking his opportunity running with it, and he's gonna. there's going to be an argument to be had that he should be – the starting left fielder um, for this team for, for the rest of the season and the rest of the way. Um, number three, going to go Glaber Torres. Uh, Glaber Torres has been showing signs of life. He, he's been on fire recently. Um, 
I remember we, he was he was in a couple of our three downs consecutive weeks in a row. Uh, he was just struggling real bad. Uh, he, his bat's coming around, and, and yeah, sure, the glove obviously not great. Uh, he's he's made some errors, not not what you want to see there, but just as far as the bat, I'm gonna go Gleyber Torres for three. All right, my three up. Although I, this guy didn't, I'm gonna say there's one honorable mention. He didn't quite make the cut. He'd make the cut if you struck out swinging with two outs and you got a guy on first base. Uh, so that would be Luis Avilon. I mean, hmm. you look at him right now. Uh, with Chapman now back in the fold, that's something we didn't mention the top role. Chapman was back Monday and didn't miss a beat throwing 101 miles an hour to strike out Rafael Devers. So that's always a good thing. But you look at the impact Avilon has had on this team. He goes out there and, and you look at a lefty. How would he fare with the new three batter rule? He does a really good job. He got out of bases loaded in the game on Monday. It seems like Boone's not afraid to put him in those big situations. And, of course, Mike King's going to get a lot of love from Monday for getting the victory. He would be a good candidate here as well because he did a good job getting his first win. I guess if you're getting your first win, you're usually playing the Red Sox this year. But King did a nice job. But Avilon quietly built himself up into that high leverage situation kind of thing. And I'm, I'm liking that, that it's somebody different that make, that's making an impact after the Yankees DFA'd David Hale, which is sad, because Hale did some good things for this team. So Avilon gets a little bit of honorable love for me here. Uh, Clint Frazier, of course, number one. What more can you say? He's just the bat speed's there. He had the big night on Saturday. He just seems to come up and get some big hits whenever the Yankees need it. He's clearly making good use of that opportunity that he's getting. He's out to prove a point. So he gets number one for me. Number two, I, you know what? We we ripped Gary Sanchez so much on this show, and rightfully so. You got to give him a little bit of love. I know he's he had the pass ball situation, but you saw Garrett Cole give him some really positive comments to the media, backing up his catcher, and it's a good thing to see as well. But Gary's starting to find it at the plate. Uh, three home runs, four home runs over his last six games. You're starting to see the offense kind of get back a little bit. Yes, the average is still well below 200, but I feel like he's had a good week, week at least from a power perspective. He did get the two-run homer on Saturday to give the Yankees the 4-3 lead. They never looked back from there, so he deserves credit there. He had a big home run on Friday's game in the middle innings. So I think as much as we've ripped Gary, and again, rightfully so, he at least deserves some love this week. And number three, I know Cole had a great performance on Friday. I know Paxton did well on Saturday. But you know Don't what? You know what? From Don't all the it. ripping we've done of this guy, I thought Jay Happ, even though it's against a bad team, did a pretty good job. Five and two-thirds, one run, three hits, struck out three. This is a guy, again, not pitching every fifth day. So that's something he's had to get used to a little bit. 75 pitches, 44 strikes. Got a lot of love from Boone in the post game, even though Boone and Hap apparently don't seem to be on the same page. But it was a Sunday night game. That's the one, if you looked, if the Yankees were going to lose any of these four games, it might have been that one. Well, Jay Hap didn't lose it. In fact, he never really had any big situations outside of the home run to Pilar that he had to really get out of. He didn't give up every one dog, base hit. Every dog has their day. <laughs> so for now, Hap called off the Clark Schmidt people just a little bit. But you have to when we rip him enough, I think you gotta give him credit for pitching a good game. So he deserves some love, uh, at least from me this week. Not from James, but I'll give it to him. I feel like I've become like the big hap supporter on the show. I never seem to be, but I feel like I have to back him more because James doesn't back him that much. Well, I mean do I have to get into it? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> so three down, I'll start. Um Brett, <laughs> Brett Gardner. Uh buddy. It's time to wake up a little bit. Um, I know we've had this discussion for years at the, to this point uh, that it's time for him to go. It's actually time for him to go. Uh, I love you as a defensive replacement here, but um, it's time to hand it over to Clint Frazier or Mike Talkman, just in left field, obviously. Um, they, I don't know what Brett Gardner really offers you right now that those guys don't. Maybe Clint Frazier's defense, which, by the way, has looked extreme. Uh, substantially better um and number two we'll go miguel andujar um the guy's had a shot and he's got to be up for debate to be the worst offensive baseball player of all time um <laughs> and, and it's sad to say but i he he may be the worst offensive baseball player of all time in left field 
I, I've never seen routes like that taken to a baseball. Granted, it's new to him, but like, man, like, have you ever played the field before? It just, and he's not hidden. So, and hard too. And three, I'm going to go Tyler Wade. Um, I, I think people seem to fall in love with the little things Tyler Wade does. And granted, that's that's fine. But he's still not giving – he's giving you next to nothing at the plate. He's he, What is he at? Batting like around 200, maybe even under 200 at this point. Sure, he's fast, but what does that do for you when he doesn't hit? Um, he, he's solid defensively, but again, I'm going to say the same thing I just said for Brett Gardner. What does Tyler Wade do for you that Tyro Estrada doesn't? And Tyro Estrada has a far better bat than Tyler Wade. Um, so that that's that's my three down there. Alexis, what about you for three down? Uh, I gotta agree with uh, Brett Gardner. Um, just have not. He again, he's got to wake up. Uh, I agree with James on that. Um, I don't know what he's doing this year, but something's not working, and it, it, he's got to start clicking. Um, I think for me too, I gotta stay. I gotta stay James Paxton. I hate to do it. I thought his performance was a little bit better against the Red Sox, but still giving up those big three runs. Uh, still, I, don't, I just don't think we're seeing his best stuff yet this season. Um, hard to hard to go with another another down. Um, you know, Gary Sanchez is starting to wake up. Uh, so, um, I think if anything, you know, a, a third down. Uh, maybe Kratz. I don't think we're seeing too much from him. Uh, he's great defensively, but I don't think he's doing much offensively either. Yeah, not the line you expect from Paxton to get five innings, three runs, six hits, two strikeouts, one walk. Uh, the only mistake he made really in that game, I mean, you get to give a double to Devers, but Bogarts hit him for a home run in the third inning. Bogarts also hit him hard in the Sunday night game, I think a week or two ago. So Xander Bogarts really only hitting hitter on the Red Sox. So if you read Buster Olney's tweet a little while ago, the Yankees were very impressed by Alex Verdugo, uh, who went two for four of the home run Saturday's game two. But that was off of Sessa the ninth. So if Paxson didn't have the great line. He did good enough because the Yankees gave him a huge lead in the sixth inning, although he left before the Yankees scored four in the sixth and three in the seventh. But I could see where you would go with the, the Paxson situation. Kratz, it's tough because, again, you don't have Kyle Higashioka right now. Chris Hyde had retired. The only thing I think you look for for Kratz is I kind of like if he's the one catching Montgomery the fifth day and Montgomery looked really good before the rain delay. It may be something from AAA where he clicked with him. I think kind of works in that way. If you can have a guy that Montgomery's comfortable with just as a fielder, maybe you play Sanchez at DH that day, you can get away with it. Because there is value to Kratz for a degree because he's caught a lot of these younger guys that the Yankees are using. But I'm not looking at not looking for him to go like hit 300. I mean, maybe my expectation yeah. just that low for him, but that's yeah. I don't. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm not really. Uh, Eric Kratz really isn't. You know, he's not the guy I'm looking for more here. It just, he he could do he could re- go over for every game. I probably wouldn't care. All right, so my three down. I'm gonna go with James. I'm gonna go with Anduar here, and maybe not for that defensive error that he made over the weekend. I, I feel like the Yankees, if he's up, I'm glad he's up playing it should just be to hit or play third base you could worry about left field next year in spring training if you want for right now if he's up on this team you have guys that can play left we've talked about Estrada could play outfield if you need him to Wade could play outfield if you need him to you could play Topman at the corner you could play Frazier at the corner you play Gardner even though he's been terrible but you could play him at the corner there's many more options you have before you have to play in too hard in a corner outfield position I'd rather him either DH or give Urshela a day at third base. You could obviously even play Urshela at second if you really wanted to and play Andujar at third on some days. The Yankees can get creative. You don't need Andujar playing left field this year. You want to work on it next year in Tampa? Fine. These are not the times you work on it. Not all his fault. Like James said, he hasn't played the position a lot. Uh, but I think you have to give him a down this week. I'm going to go with Brett Gardner, too, which means next week Brett Gardner is going to have a huge week, like we seem to talk about with Gary Sanchez. We're going to go there with Brett Gardner. He's just been terrible. Both of them have talked about it. Number three, can I go Jonathan Holder? <sighs> because you look at Friday's well, that- game. You look at Friday's game, that's one where you shouldn't have to worry about Adam Avino pitching. And that could be one where, again, you could have had Adam Avino tonight. 
and you look at kind of the little things that happen in games that kind of cost you down the road two or three days afterwards, like you shouldn't have to use Adovino in a game that you're dominating the Red Sox in. So Jonathan Holder is to go out there and just throw strikes. And I love Jonathan Holder. I'm a big Jonathan Holder guy. But you, we look at kind of the – I mean, we're kind of nitpicking because the Yankees didn't do a lot negative against the Red Sox. But if you look at Fry's game in particular, and Cole gave you great seven innings, that's when you got to use the holders, the cesses, and get through the rest of that game and not have to use an elite reliever where you could use them on a game where it's closer. Those appearances in a 60-game season add up. So that's when I kind of want to see Hold do a lot better in a game where the Yankees are dominating. Just go out there, throw strikes, period. And you have guys now like King and Nelson that are doing pretty good in those roles. You start to wonder, okay, what's Jonathan Holder doing at this point? He stinks. <laughs> I, I, he's another one of those guys that I just really hate. Um, not not as a person, obviously. John, I'm sure he's a fun guy. But just oh, as a pitcher, every time he goes in there in, in an important spot, it just seems like he gives up runs. It, it 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 almost feels like when Aaron Boone runs to Jonathan and hit, raises that right arm and goes to Jonathan Holder, he he's throwing the towel. Um, I, I, that's just how I see him as. Um, you can give him some props, like you, man, you're three. Oh, you went three down for Holder, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, he stinks. He he's bad. I agree with you. He's horrible. That's just he. I, I for some reason I thought you meant three up. No. Yeah, but he no, because bad. you want get, you want games like that where okay I can avoid using Chad Green, I can avoid using Adovino, I can avoid using Britain. And this was yes before Chapman came back, but you kind of need games like that if Boone's going to be careful at using these guys. You kind of have to finish games in the same way. It's different from Holder pitching in the end of the Rays series, which is another thing different. Uh, but I think you have to. Be a little bit mindful, okay? You and you have a big lead like that, just throw strikes. That's something. Just just let let the let the offense put it in play and just see where it goes. They put it in play. They put it in play. You're up by a ton of runs. Yeah, he's he's just he's bad. He's really bad. every time Boone goes to him, he's throwing in the towel. That's how that's always how I see it. When they when the Yankees are down or chasing a run or 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 they're tied and he goes to Holder, it's so frustrating to see because you just know he's gonna do something bad. Ugh, another guy, another another one that I'm gonna have to root, not, not root against. Another one I'm gonna have to rip every time we talk about him. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think there's a problem when you can pretty much guarantee that uh, when Holder comes in, whoever we're playing is either gonna come back or they're gonna surpass our score, whatever it, that score might even be, until Aaron Boone wakes up and takes him out all over again. Uh, which I think it's a recurring theme that Holder goes point one. I think James and I were talking this weekend, and Holder came in. Lo and behold, gave up like three runs and comes out of, you know, or whoever came in to replace him that night. Uh, Holder needs to go back to satellite camp. Uh, where's Clark Schmidt? Seems to be the big, every move, every move the Yankees make on Twitter. I mean, the, the Ben Howard move last night, setting in the alternate camp, sounded alarm. So where's, it's Clark Schmidt, it's Clark Schmidt, it's Clark Schmidt. That's what I thought. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if we're getting Clark Schmidt until September 1st, which is, if, if you get him at all. And I think you That'd be great to see Clark Schmidt as kind of that trade deadline move-ish. Because, again, I, I with two weeks left for the deadline, I don't see where the Yankees are getting an elite piece from. I know people talked no. about big names and talk about the, the Indians pitchers, which didn't help themselves again. Zach, please, Zach, can you please not go on your Instagram or Twitter and make a rant about the media while you're driving out your seatbelt on? Is it <laughs> is it that hard? And kudos to Oliver Perez. Saying, look, I'll opt out if these guys are he- don't get punished. So I'll give him a lot of kudos for that. That's not easy to do either. No. So those guys have taken their medicine and hopefully they're learned from it because that was a that's an absolute mess. The Indians aren't trading Clevenger though. The guy's too talented. No. Yeah. No. I don't. They're not trading either of them. Um. Yeah. I know. I know. I saw someone today say that they're, they're available. Um. They're not getting traded. I, I don't care what anyone says. That, that There's just no way. And also, I think, Alexis, it comes down to, we, we talked about it a little last week, and we'll keep talking about it until the deadline's up. I mean, look at the teams that are probably out right now. You don't want anybody on the Red Sox. You're not going to get anybody from the Red Sox anyway. I mean, the Royals, not going to get anybody from the Royals. Seattle, the Angels, maybe, who, by Mike Trout's hitting home runs, and they're 8-16. and 16. They're terrible. Uh 
anybody in the NL East can win it, so I'm going to count them out. You don't want anybody on the Pirates. And the Giants, you know, I mean, who do you want on the Giants? I mean, these bad teams, there's not a lot of elite guys you want. Yeah, I, I don't know that. Yeah, I don't know where we're getting guys from this year. Um, I kind of think the Yankees are going to stick with their lineup uh, that they have and their roster that they have. Uh, I just I don't see many teams even uh, I guess maybe the Red Sox are open to trades right now, but I don't see teams going for trades. Uh, the only guy I'd say I'd want uh, maybe from the Red Sox, and that was if he was healthy, was Chris Sale. Uh, absolutely love the guy as a pitcher. Uh, went to the same college as him, so I might be a little biased, but I've always loved Sale as a pitcher. Um, unfortunate that he's missing out this year. Um, but other than that, yeah, I don't I don't know who you're going for. At least that's who's available, who any team's going to be willing to trade. I mean, in a perfect yeah, the Red, world, I think the Red Sox would rather drop dead. Yeah. Than you would look at a Red Sox Drew drop Kelly dead. Johnson trade from years ago. Just trade yeah. random infielder for random infielder. Yeah. And I don't know. They're going to have to go with what they got. They are. Um, there's, I said it a couple of weeks ago. Brian Cash is not parting with valuable pieces for three starts. Um, it's just not going to happen. So they're going to have to go with what they got. The crazy, the only crazy thing I could think of would be if Washington fell more out of it, the Strasburg injury. But you're not, they're not trading for Scherzer with that contract either. You're not getting elite arms. Like the Nationals would be an interesting one, but everybody in the NL East is alive. It's that's how bad the division is, which is weird. We always thought that'd be the good division. It's arguably the worst division. Uh, but that's really the only thing. I see San Diego's good. Arizona's good. Cincinnati's nine and eleven, but they're still four and a half behind, even though the Cubs have come back, fallen back a little bit. Miami's nine and eight, even though they've lost four in a row. Texas is ten and twelve, but on the borderline of a playoff spot. Detroit, as I'll talk about later, calls up Casey Mize to pitch Wednesday. It seems like the bad teams are going to call up top prospects and stick around pretty much. We'll talk about a new top prospect every day pretty much now. But that's going to be something to keep an eye on, uh, at least for a couple of weeks. So the Yankees this week, they finish up with Tampa. Good matchup on Wednesday. Glasnow against Cole. And then Paxton goes to the Yankees on Thursday. And then the matchup with the Mets. And let's let's talk about the Mets. Because, uh, yeah, they've beaten the Marlins the last couple of days. But they're 11-14. and 14. They're only three and a half behind, though. Which the Mets right now would be a game behind the Phillies for third place. And you want to get in the third place. Although... The NL West could get all could get four of their five teams in, which is weird. But Marcus Stroman's opted out. David Peterson's on the IL. We talked about him on the show. You're likely getting Rick Porcello, Stephen Matz, maybe. I don't think I don't like Matz might pitch against the Marlins. Rick Porcello and who knows what in that Met rotation. Michael Walk is hurt. It's gonna be a weird subway series, Alexis, because you're not gonna get Cole. You're not gonna get DeGrom. It's just going to, we love, I love the Subway series. It's great in my house because I know Met fans, but the Mets has, I mean, if anything, I think you got to watch out for this Met offense starting to heat up a little bit, although they never get clutch hits, but there's still good names in that lineup. Anytime it's yeah. Yankees Mets, you got to be wor- a little, a little bit worried. Um, Cause the Mets, it always feels like the Mets think they have something to prove. Um, yeah. Anytime it's Yankees Mets, I get a little bit concerned. But um, we'll see. We'll, hopefully the Yankees get some of their guys back um, by then. Uh, by guys, I mean Aaron Judge. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, definitely be nice to have Judge back uh, for this series. Uh, the bats definitely need to be swinging. Uh, the Mets have a good lineup. I don't care how you look at it. Um, have they played their best this year? No. Uh, but I think they're like the Rays. They can be hot or cold, um, and it's time for them to make a – it's not time for them to do something, but I think they're, so, they're a team that people need to not sleep on and need to wake up on, and it's always an exciting series when it's Yankees versus Mets uh, in the Bronx or at City Field. Yeah, one of the guys I'm, I'm keeping an eye on, I mean, two guys I'll probably go, J.D. Davis, guys just seem to always seem to find a way to hit. We I mean, know about McNeils and the Alonzos and Conforto, but Davis can make an impact. And Dom Smith, Dom Smith's getting to play every day. Or most every day, he's not bad. I think the DH helps the Mets in that regard because he's one of the better OPS plus guys in the league. And you would not think that. You could name a bunch of guys before you named Dom Smith. But he's found a way 
in a crazy Met career he's had, he's a force in that line. They have two good first basemen with him and Alonzo. So I think Dom Smith's going to be that crazy X factor you want to keep an eye on because he just seems to get a big hit when he comes to the plate. And Mets don't have any guys right now that get big hits with runners in scoring position. They're one of the worst teams, I think, hitting in that situation. So it's going to be a weird series. Again, no big aces on the mound, but this is where you want the Yankees. They've done it against bad teams or mediocre teams. Just take care of business. And I seem to do that more often than not. There's plenty we can go to for our around the league discussion this week. But I want to keep it mainly to Fernando Tatis Jr., who is arguably the MVP in the National League right now. The kid's amazing. He's so fun to watch. And the Texas Rangers got really angry that he wanted to hit a grand slam in the 3-0 count when the Padres were dominating the game. And guess what? The Padres dominated again on Tuesday. Fernando Tatis stole third with the Padres up by six. And the Rangers got even more angry. And you know what? Good on Fernando Tatis. I don't care what Chris Woodward has to say. And I kind of tweeted it today. In the era of advanced analytics, 3-0 count, you know what you're getting. If you grew a fastball down the middle of the plate, that's your fault. You, at this point, you just better throw 3-0 sliders or 3-0 off-speed pitches. We've seen it because pitchers are afraid to get fastballs crushed over the wall on 3-0 counts. I'm sorry you're offended because someone took you over the wall. Too bad. Get over it. You lost the game anyway. There's no mercy rule in baseball. It's it's different stealing a base. I get that. But Tatis still third in the fourth inning up six. I think you're still allowed to play hard in that situation. Really, the Rangers just, I think, should make a lot of people angry. It seems like they, they're really soft when it comes to this. And, and the fact we have to hear about this unwritten rule is so stupid because Tatis is, we usually talk about how great and how, Fernando Tatis could very well, honestly, we talk about Judge being the face of baseball. This is a guy who could be the face of baseball in the next three to five years, not named Mike Trout. He is so good. Yeah, he he is he's fantastic. But I I I stand by my argument that if you if you're playing when half the country's sleeping, uh, I don't know if you can be the face of baseball. But sure, he can be the best player in the game one day, a thousand percent. But but that I mean that's a guy you can promote. Is he's fun. He hits home runs. Baseball doesn't bases. promote people. He's a great fielder. He does everything. Yeah, they don't. Do, they don't. They, you know, they don't promote people. They don't. They're. They're so. Mike. Tra- if Mike Trout walked into the Roosevelt Field Mall in Garden City, I guarantee you, seventy percent of the people would not even know it's him. Um, Mike baseball Trout's doesn't. Promote, baseball team. No, I'm not aware, but baseball doesn't promote their guys. That, that that's first and foremost. Second, this entire discussion of, of swinging on 3-0 up seven I, I can't even believe it it's it's being had um what are we doing here Th- does it these unwritten rules of baseball are so trash uh if it's not a written rule then then please just get that stuff out of my face i don't it, it, i don't care baseball should, first of all baseball should kind of want this we want to see home runs here to promote this game home runs are exciting um and if you don't want a guy to swing 3-0 uh, on a fastball down the middle and make a better pitch. It's just that simple. Make a better pitch. I don't like. Is 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 he supposed to feel bad that you're down seven? Uh, is that where we're at in Major League Baseball? We need the other te- other team to feel bad. Um, it's it's so gross. I cannot believe this discussion. It just shows that we have so far to go as a society in baseball before we really appeal to that younger generation. Um, it, it, it's, it's so tired and old. I can't deal with it. And Alexis, I'm going to give credit to major league baseball who gave, you know what? They gave the Texas Rangers pitcher. I'm trying to get the name uh, correct, but gave him a three game suspension to throw him behind Manny Machado. That's even more weak. You got a problem with Tatis. You're playing Tatis the next day, throw behind him. Why you got to throw behind Machado for like, you're going to try to hit him, and maybe he gets hurt because of something another teammate did, which was, wasn't out of bounds? Like, to me, that was also weak by the Rangers. Again, it's just something like, you want to handle your business, handle it with the guy you're mad at. Don't handle it with a guy that just happens to be the next player at the plate. And the umpires didn't give a warning, but at least baseball, which we give them a bunch of garbage for getting suspensions wrong, at least they got ahead of it and said, you know what, we can't have this. Yeah, I it, there was no reason to throw at Machado. That made absolutely no sense at all. Um, I, I thought it was ridiculous. On with James. It's not a written rule, so get out of here with it. Um, these guys are trying to build stats this year. What are you going to tell the guys? Don't go out there and play. 
that no, let the guys play. Um, even Joe Girardi said in his press conference today, he'd let the guys go, he'd let them hit, he'd let them play. Guy had seven RBIs that night. He had a phenomenal night, two home runs. Uh, he's playing the game. Um, if you're mad about it, come back offensively and try to bring the score down. I, I don't know what else. And, and somebody brought up a good point. It, it, Tatis doesn't make you, – you, you, obviously, he's looking for that big contract, but you want to pad your numbers so that when you go to arbitration – you get a, you get more money because you hit more home runs, regardless of what the situation is. So why wouldn't Tatis try to hit home run? We kind of saw it a little bit in the game today with the Yankees. Diego Castillo is not throwing Luke Voigt any fastballs because he knows Luke Voigt can hit a fastball. You know enough there, even though we can't watch a lot of video now, to where you don't you're not throwing 2-0 fastballs anymore. You're not throwing 3-0 fastballs down the middle because guess what? If you're a pitcher mad about 3-0. If you get two strikes, you're basically ahead in the count 3-2 because now you can throw anything you want. So why shouldn't the hitter take advantage of a 3-0 count? If anything, if the hitter gets out in a 3-0, then we can get on him for it. Maybe you shouldn't have swung if the pitcher's all over the place. But we're in an era of the game now where you can swing 3-0. If you have the green light and you're on a roll and you see a pitch you like, swing at it. Try to do damage. I mean, that's because now we're seeing pitchers do things differently and not always grooving fastballs over the plate anymore. Yeah, it's it's gross. I I can't I, I I cannot believe the discussions being had last night. I can't even believe people were talking about it. It's so it's so bad. And by the way, if you're baseball, if you want the younger generation to get into the game, stop the unwritten rules stuff. It gets more people not to watch your sport than it does to actually watch your sport. Tatis is one of those guys you should want to turn on the TV and watch. And now we're talking about unwritten rules and all this stuff. The guy, as I said, he's borderline the MVP in the National League. He's likely going to get the Padres the shot at the playoffs this year. And they're a fun team. They're a young team. It's great. It's a great story if they do get in. But but talk about when he does stuff really good. Because the kid is – we should be talking about how talented the kid is. Not because he wanted to swing at a 3-0 pitch and hit a home run. Which he's on fire right now. I mean, that, that's a guy – I know we can't go to games, but that's a guy you would absolutely pay to watch right now. And, and shout out to the Starting Nine podcast who just – who not just tweeted out. Just, uh, earlier today tweeted out a picture of, of now Texas Rangers manager, the guy who was complaining, Chris Woodward, um, giving Manny Machado a high five after he swung 3-0 and hit a home run up 7-1 when he was the third base coach of the Los Angeles Dodgers. So uh, – it wasn't it wasn't an issue for for him then when when his team was the one doing the blowing out there, but it was an issue for him when he was getting absolutely murdered. Um, yep, not not a great look for you, Chris Woodward. Not a great not a great look at all. And last thing on this, and and I know I wanted to bring this up too. I know Jace Tingler, the Padres manager, which I guess not a lot of people would know Jace Tingler is the Padres manager, but he is. But defend your player. I, I found yeah. it really weird that Tatis had to apologize. Like, I'm with Charlie Bauer. No, don't apologize. Happy you hit a home run. Like, I feel like if I'm t- if I'm his man, if I'm, if, if I'm Tatis, I'm, my manager basically made me look like I screwed up. No. That's why I think, I know Tingler's trying to be like, not trying to make anybody angry. But that's when I, I would want my manager to stick up. But if, I, if that's Aaron Boone and Mike, like, for example, I want to stick up for my player. And I don't feel Tingo did that. And he, he kind of addressed that. I know saying he could have said better words and things like that. So I, I'm not going to get on him totally. But again, that's one I want. I want you to stick up for the player. Agreed. So let's get into final thoughts. Uh, of course, we, we talked about a lot going on in baseball, so let's get right into final thoughts. We can talk about more things baseball if you want, because, again, final thoughts is basically whatever you want to talk about. Uh, so, James, I'll start with you. What's your final thought for this week? Uh, final thoughts is kind of that we're back where we were last year uh, as far as the Yankees. Everyone's getting hurt again, um, although this time it seems to be on a less uh, less more serious scale with pertaining uh, Aaron Judge, John Carlos Stan, and then DJ LeMayu, but uh, they, the Yankees lost Sean Carl Stanton, DJ LeMayu, and Aaron Judge all at, within a matter of like a week or two. Um, and they were still winning baseball games. So that, uh, all the more impressive and just a testament to how deep this organization is and just how 
just a winning culture. I, I keep saying, I keep beating beating dead horse here, but the winning culture plays such a big role. So, um, shout out to to the Yankees and the de- and and the amount of guys they have in this organization that can put together quality major league at bats night in and night out. And shout out to myself for shooting 88 on Beth Page Black today. <laughs> James is getting the early admission into the FedEx Cup playoffs. Correct. So he's, trying, he's trying to qualify. Yep. I'm 17 uh, over, so we'll, we'll see where I go. <laughs> Alexis, what do you got for uh, final thoughts this week? Oh, man, my final thoughts. I just have to give a quick shout out uh, to um, Leighwin Diaz of the Miami Marlins. Uh, got to follow the guy uh, while he was in Fort Myers and part of the Twins organization. Uh, collected his first career MLB hit. And his first ever MLB at bat in his debut this weekend. Um, really great to see out of a great guy. Um, and then congratulations to Kent Maeda tonight of the Twins on a phenomenal performance. Just lost a no hit bid in the ninth inning. Uh, heartbreaking way to lose that no hit bid, but phenomenal performance for him tonight. Definitely. By the way, as I said earlier, it's great to see the Marlins, the Orioles, and the Tigers and teams like that at least be competitive. Like, that's a good thing to see. They may not make the playoffs, but the teams that we all thought would be horrible are not that bad this year. And that's great. I don't know what baseball is going to do with the draft order for next year, but you know what? I'm glad to see the Orioles playing hard. And and honestly, the Yankees have been the only team that's dominated them when you really look at it. The, the Marlins have had a little bit of a rough patch over the last few days, but with the, basically a new team. The Cardinals won a, a doubleheader on the, over the weekend with a, basically a new team, practically. Hopefully on Wednesday, we'll get everybody back playing again. The Reds had some positive cases, but uh, hopefully they'll get back to playing and everybody will be playing baseball again. That'll, that'll be great. Uh, but I want to give a little bit to the Tigers. And some I, I love profiling big-time players that get to get make their debut. I know the Braves call it Christian Pache. The outfielder, who's going to be, I think, a good talent for the Braves. They always seem to find good pieces. Casey Mize makes his debut on Wednesday. Number one pick a couple of years ago. And at least he gets a chance to play. I'm excited to get to see him play or get to see him pitch. I did a lot, I watched like an SEC tournament start covering the draft for us here at Pinch High Prospects just to get an idea of what he is. And the kid's fantastic. I'm really excited to see what he can do. The Tigers have so many good young arms. I, we've seen Nate Pearson a little bit, even though he struggled somewhat. Uh, at least you can see the talent he has. Just, I love the fact that teams are being aggressive and calling up top prospects. So we get to see more young talent in the game. Uh, so having Mize in the fold, that's always great. Uh, good time in sports. NBA playoffs, NHL playoffs are in f- full swing. Still weird things in college football. I mean, we already had North Carolina and Notre Dame basically go virtual classes. Um so something to keep an eye on, uh, but save that stuff. I'm not going to go there, but I would say just enjoy the fact for baseball that there are not a lot of really awful teams. And I guess in 60 games, you can't get, there's not a lot of time to be really awful, although ask the Pittsburgh Pirates because they're really bad. But I don't know about both of you. It's great to see teams that are bad normally actually compete. And I, there was a time I got really excited about the Marlins until they lost a couple of games in a row, and now I don't know what to think of them. But, I mean, maybe they'll, with the 18 playoff, we'll see new teams, and they'll get experience, and maybe we'll have less bad teams than we've had in the past when we go back to 162 again. Yeah, I, the, the only thing I don't – I do like it to, to an extent, but like I, I don't like that if one of these teams get in and just delegitimizes the whole season – uh, that's that's what you don't want, but I, I don't mind them being competitive and, and going out there and playing hard every day. Uh, I think that's pretty cool to see. But overall, I, I don't want to see them do too well because I don't want them to delegitimize this season. I wonder though, looking at it also before we wrap this up, look because we're play, since the Yankees playing the Mets and they're playing the Braves next time we're back here. Right now, the NL East leaders, the Braves, at fourteen and eleven. Is the NL East winner going to finish above five hundred? I, you know, I don't know. Um, you would like to think, but what, hold on, let me pull up the standings here now. I'll so have, I have it right here. Marlins nine so, and eight, a game behind. Phillies eight and nine, two games behind. Mets eleven and fourteen, three behind. Nats nine and twelve, three behind. And the Nats without um, Strasburg still. Very possible. Uh, I, but I, I do. 
No, I think the Phillies are the Phillies are gonna grab that, and I, I do think they're gonna be over five hundred. Um, yeah, I, I it may be tight, but I'm 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 pretty certain that uh, the second place team here will will be over five hundred. Alexis. Um, what was that question again? NL is the NL East winner going to finish with an above five hundred record? Oh, that's right. Um. I don't know, man. The NL East isn't looking great this year. Uh, I I don't know if they will or not. I mean, the Braves got nothing. I mean, they're starting Josh Tomlin in their rotation with Soroka out. I mean, yeah. where do the Braves go? Like, I, that's the thing. Like, the Grams, the Grom, Nola, and Wheeler and Scherzer are like the top four in the East, and I guess Corbin as well. You throw in there, but then where do you go? Is Bryce Harper the NL MVP so far, or is it Fernando Tatis? Uh, it's it's Tatis. Bryce Harper has yeah. the quietest. Bryce Harper has the quietest 1200 OPS I've ever seen. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I I, I kind of like my pick for an NL MVP right now, but he, Tatis kind of taking well. over the world. He has a 1200 OPS, or he's what is he? 1166? You kidding me? Hey, anytime you can get Harper under the radar, that's scary. Because yeah, right. That that's a fun. But just Tatis just steals everything. Like that kid. Yeah. I know I'm talking a lot about how great he is, but maybe it's just I, I like seeing the Padres being actually good and thinking about them calling up Mackenzie Gore in September and all their young talent that they have. And like I said, the NL West could get four teams in to the playoffs. But it's the fact that San Diego is one of those teams that built up a draft and kind of like had some lean years through it. To me, when you look at Tatis, he's got six steals, 11 homers, 28 RBI. 31 hits and 100 at bats, hit 310, 710 slugging, plays a great defensive shortstop. And the kid's what, 21? 21, yeah. 22? He, he can't yeah. be older than 22. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the, the, the amount of young talent in baseball is absurd. Like Juan Soto, another one. I mean, geez. Juan Soto loves guy. making people angry. Apparently, he liked making Will Smith angry the other day. I love I love what Juan Soto does. So do I. I think he's a lot of fun. <laughs> Keep hitting moonshots into the Coca-Cola porch yeah. at City Field. Four, My goodness. Nine with seven home runs in eleven games. Can you imagine? We've learned from this. You can. T- it's weird. I know Joe Sherman's with this. You can have a long absence and still hit. Yeah. Mayhew's done it. Soto's done it. The Marlins have won games. The Cardinals have won games. I know it's you, it's different, but it, apparently you can have long absent long times where you don't play and still be good. Yep. We did not think, but uh, we had a long show and a great show. Uh, happy to be with you once again this week. We'll be back next week uh, when after the Yankees finish up their game against the Braves. So we'll talk about a little bit of Atlanta. We'll recap the rest of this Rays series and the Mets series. And before you know it, after our show next week, September's here. One month away from the playoffs. So that'll be, that's a, that'll be a lot of fun. And we'll get into more trade rumors, of course. That'll be our last show before uh, August 31st, trade deadline, if there are any trade rumors. Uh, so, James, how can they follow you on Twitter? As I'm sure you'll be talking uh, some NBA draft lottery and some uh, FedEx Cup playoffs this week. Mm-hmm. Um, Tiger playing in Boston this week. Real excited about that. Crazy field uh, uh, this week in Boston. But uh, you can give me a follow at O'Connell NY on Twitter. And Alexis, how can they follow you on Twitter as you do a good job with our social media as usual? You can follow me at Alexis Farinacci. That's my full name, nice and simple. And you follow me on Twitter at Rickinator555. That's at R-A-C-K, letter I, near like and Terminator555. Hope you'll be back with Kicking with Keyword this week on Full Press Radio. Didn't get a chance to record this week. Had a little bit of technical issues, but we'll be back again this week. Got a lot to talk about in sports. I'll have more on the Tati stuff because I'll just rant on that for a while, but I'll do a little basketball a little hockey, uh, of course, with football. Got to talk about that and whole nine yards. You can catch my work as well at Barrett Sports Media. I did a little of a review of the new Keyshawn Johnson, J. Williams, Zubin Mahenti ESPN Radio morning show. I thought it was okay. Uh, not great for the first show, but hopefully it'll get better. I had some good guests, but you can read more of that on Barrett Sports Media where I'm talking all things uh, ESPN personalities, their shows, uh, et cetera. Again, follow us on Twitter at Pinstripe Pros. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. 
Hope you give us a rating. We want to be five stars. We want to hear from you. Give us your feedback. Uh, what you like, what you don't like. You can, e- you can email me, rickjkeeler at gmail.com. Uh, be sure, of course, to sign up for our Dug Up membership program. Again, $5.50 a month or $40 a year. And you get a free trial for 30 days using the hashtag Welcome Back Baseball. You can use the hashtag Welcome Back Baseball and catch Alexis's interviews with Beck Way and Montana Semmel as part of that Dug Up membership program. Interviews you do not want to miss. So for James O'Connell, for Alexis Farinacci, I'm Ricky Keeler. And for our founder, Rob Pimson, as well, saying have a great rest of your week. Stay safe. Wear a mask. We'll be back next week to talk about the Rays, the Mets, and a little bit of the Braves as the Yankees continue, hopefully, their winning ways. Until then, we'll see you next time. Later. Have a great night.